It was Sunday morning. I was in Florence with my wife and my children. I received a news about a potential problem in the Mediterranean, but nobody understood in the first hour of morning what really happened. In the middle of the night, the Italian Coast Guard had received reports that a boat carrying migrants from Africa was in trouble near the Italian island of Lampedusa. More than 800 people were feared dead. The terrible thing was the news about children. The children in the ship, they were locked in the room and they died, closed in this room. My daughter was nine years old, so as father, I decided to call the, the other leaders of European Council. Prime Minister Renzi called me asking for an extraordinary European Council meeting. And I knew that this is the moment when the most dramatic crisis started. The European Union was created to hold a continent together. Instead, it faced a decade of turmoil and fracture. Il fallait un peu comme un corps qui se vide de son sang, il fallait garroter la plaie. Here, presidents and prime ministers reveal how the arrival of hundreds of thousands of migrants on Europe's shores threatened to tear the continent apart. Do not come to Europe. It is all for nothing. I was strongly encouraging her not to close the border. For the first time in a generation, East and West were pitted against each other as fences went up across Europe. Crossing of the border is a crime. Defend the border. The door was opened for those intent on destroying the EU. Four days after the tragedy at Lampedusa, Donald Tusk convened the 28 leaders who make up the European Council for an emergency summit. We are meeting today in light of the dramatic situation in the Mediterranean, and I have no doubts that this is a European issue, not, not just a problem for, for member states in Southern Europe. The man at the center of the crisis, Matteo Renzi, arrived demanding action. Under EU law, Italy was responsible for dealing with the thousands of migrants landing on its shores. Now Renzi wanted to share the burden by sending them on to other EU countries. First, uh, let us stand for a minute silence for the victims, not just of the last week, but of the 2000s before them. Renzi had his work cut out. He was trying to compel his fellow leaders to do something that was likely to be unpopular with their voters. Please, we have to accept the idea migration is not an Italian problem. I'm not here to ask you, please save with me Italy. I'm here with you to save European values. Renzi, as always, was quite arrogant playing a tough guy, but in fact uh, running away from responsibility. He said, you know, this is a question of solidarity. And my answer was, sorry, dear friend, but uh, uh, there's no, there's not such a thing like forced solidarity. It's a clear oxymoron. It wasn't just solidarity that was in question. Many leaders, particularly those from Eastern Europe, were worried about the unintended consequences of sharing the migrants out by quota. The quota system is an invitation. Whatever quota system you have, even the voluntary quota system, would be an invitation for those who would like to come because there's hope that if you come illegally, there's going to be some kind of solution for you. 
Our approach was no compulsory quota and no voluntary quota. Des pays se, se, se refusent à imaginer même accepter des réfugiés. C'est pour ça que la discussion est tendue. Là, il fallait traiter ce sujet et Renzi avait raison. La répartition allait poser des problèmes. Et euh, qu'il y aurait euh, le refus euh, des pays, notamment de l'Est, par rapport à cette euh, obligation qui leur serait imposée. Donc je préférais que l'on reste sur euh, des logiques de volontariat. The plan wouldn't apply to everyone. Britain, outside the EU's passport free Schengen zone, could opt out of any system to share the burden of migrants. Its prime minister was determined to keep it that way. Today's meeting has got to be about saving lives. Now, Britain, as ever, will help. Of course, under the right conditions, and that must include that people that we pick up and people we deal with are taken to the nearest safe country, most likely Italy, and don't have immediate recourse to claim asylum in the UK. The Prime Minister's position was, you know, we recognise the gravity of the political crisis. We're not part of a common system and chose not to be part of a common system. We're not about to join it. So if there is a European solution which involves any sort of mandatory response by individual member states, that's your business, but I shall not be, I shall not be part of it. The European Council agreed a plan to share a limited number of migrants around Europe. But it would only be done on a voluntary basis. Many countries said they would never sign up. Italy was totally alone, totally. Renzi may have been alone in the European Council, but he did have one powerful ally in Brussels. Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the European Commission, the EU's civil service. He had long pushed for sharing migrants around Europe. Now he rode into battle. J'ai dit que la réponse du Conseil européen fut immédiate, mais qu'elle ne fut pas suffisante. À vrai dire, moi, j'en ai assez des poèmes. Ich mag Betroffenheitsrhetorik am Anfang, aber nicht Betroffenheitslyrik und Rhetorik auf Dauer. Il faut agir et nous, nous proposons un système de relocalisation à travers toute l'Union européenne. La solidarité doit être partagée. He said that we must open the doors to stop the people coming through the windows. And uh, he was applauded for this. And my appeal to the parliament to strengthen um, the protection of our external borders met with uh, hostile and cold silence. Thank you. The row would continue for months to come. My point was either we are Europeans living together in a well-organized family where people do love each other, or we are an international organization like, like others. I was rather sentimental when it came to this issue because it was for me a kind of revisiting the fundamentals of the European Union. He implied that he didn't care about our opinion, our recommendation, also to demonstrate that the Commission is more important in this process than, than the Member States. And I said, Jean-Claude, this is not only a very wrong strategy, but your method, your arrogance and, your, and, and the substance of your decision uh, will only help anti-European uh, populists and political cynics. The flow of migrants into Europe was already providing ammunition for Europe's populists. Following the Arab Spring, the numbers making the journey from Africa and the Middle East had reached record levels. In Eastern Europe, poorer countries, who had most recently joined the EU, were taking an increasingly hard line. Leading the way was Hungary, whose Prime Minister Viktor Orban was building an enormous fence along his southern border to keep migrants out. Crossing of the border is a crime. Defend the border. And if you are the member of European Union, especially the Schengen area, it, you have a compulsory to defend your national border, which is the European border, to stop them. The biggest player in the EU saw things differently. 
In Germany, public sentiment was more pro-migrant, as was the Chancellor, Angela Merkel. Having grown up behind the Berlin Wall, she knew how painful closed borders could be. Das ist Ausdruck gewesen des Umstands, dass wir uns um die Umstände der vielen Geflüchteten gar zu wenig gekümmert haben. Und das umfasst auch mich persönlich, das umfasst die ganze Bundesregierung. Für uns alle in Deutschland eine extreme Herausforderung in kurzer Zeit auf so viele ankommende Menschen die richtige Antwort zu finden. Ich weiß noch, wie wir mal nachts um vier aus dem Kanzleramt rausgingen nach einer langen Sitzung und sie mich beiseite nahm und mir sagte, aber Herr Gabriel, eins versprechen Sie mir, wir bauen in Deutschland keine Zäune. Ich glaube, es hat auch viel eine Rolle gespielt, dass in Deutschland der Wunsch da war, endlich mal ein freundliches Gesicht der Deutschen zu zeigen und sich vielleicht auch ein Stück zu befreien von den Erinnerungen an das finstere Deutschland. The challenge was about to become even greater. Civil war was now driving millions out of Syria, creating the biggest wave of refugees to hit Europe since the Second World War. Mohammad Zatariya had fled Syria just after finishing his military service. In time, he would play a pivotal role in the crisis. I can't go back to my country because wherever I go there, it means I have to go to army and I have to hold the gun again and I have to shoot. And I am not allowed to say I don't want because one of my friends or two of my friends, I heard about them. They said, we don't want to fight our brothers and they killed them. Mohammed followed hundreds of thousands who were now traveling to Turkey where they could pay smugglers to take them to Europe. That summer, Europe's interior ministers gathered to discuss how to deal with the growing crisis. The clash over whether to share migrants around the EU or to toughen up the borders was intensifying. As it was Luxembourg's turn to hold the EU presidency, its minister would chair the meeting. J'ai dit à tout le monde, écoutez, sur base de cette proposition, combien de personnes êtes-vous prêts à accepter? Die Aufgabenstellung für Asselborn war natürlich eine unglaublich schwierige, wo er nicht von der Hoffnung ausgegangen ist, dass Österreich hier auch Flüchtlinge nimmt im Rahmen von Relocation. Da gab es aber von mir eine ganz klare Antwort, nämlich ein No-Go, ein ganz klares Nein. Ich habe gesagt, wenn jeder chacun refuse de parler de la relocation, alors on n'arrivera à rien. Dass es nicht sein kann, dass ein bereits stark belastetes Land noch mehr Menschen aufnehmen muss, während andere Mitgliedstaaten ihrer Verantwortung überhaupt noch nicht gerecht geworden sind. The strongest resistance came from the Eastern Europeans, who argued that the focus should be on keeping migrants out in the first place. Évidemment, je me rappelle très bien le, le Slovaque. Bon, il m'a dit non, non, non. À la fin du compte, il en a pris son. Avec le hongrois, c'était encore plus dur parce qu'il ne parle aucune langue, disons, que moi, je, je sais véhiculer un tout petit peu. Donc, ni anglais, ni français, ni allemand. Et euh, bon, je n'avais pas besoin de ça parce que c'était non, non, non. Asselborn had set out to share a modest 40,000 migrants around Europe. In the face of opposition from the Eastern Europeans, he got nowhere near his target. At the same time, the number of migrants arriving continued to rise. Mohammed was just one who paid traffickers a thousand euros to take them from the Turkish coastal town of Izmir across the Aegean to Greece. From there, he temporarily left the EU traveling through Macedonia and Serbia before reaching the Hungarian border where Orban had built his fence. Tens of thousands were now using what had become known as the Balkan route, the most popular way for migrants to get to Western Europe. On his way, Mohammed had to stop at a police station to get the papers he'd need to carry on. There was one guy from Africa 
he is in front of me and the police he said where are you from and he said i am from syria then i said what he's not from syria he's lying and then he said no i'm from syria i'm from aleppo and he learned two or three words in arabic and in that time i thought so much people they were saying that they are from syria no matter where they were from the vast majority of migrants were aiming to reach Germany, with its reputation for welcoming refugees and providing them with jobs. The German Interior Ministry was expecting hundreds of thousands to arrive that year alone. The Chancellor was grappling with how to respond when she encountered a Palestinian refugee on German television. Ich bin mit meiner ganzen Familie hergekommen. Ich bin ja jetzt hier, lebe zwar, aber äh Ich weiß nicht, wie meine Zukunft aussieht, solange ich nicht wirklich weiß, dass ich hier bleiben kann. Ich verstehe das und ähm, dennoch muss ich jetzt auch, ähm, das ist manchmal auch hart Politik, so wenn du jetzt vor mir stehst und dann bist du ja ein unheimlich sympathischer Mensch, aber du weißt auch, wenn wir jetzt sagen, ihr könnt alle kommen, das können wir nicht, auch nicht schaffen. Oh, komm. Du hast das doch prima gemacht, weil wir ja euch nicht in solche Situationen bringen wollen und weil du es ja auch schwer hast, ja? In August, the German Chancellor took her annual holiday in the Alps. She was still wrestling with how to balance her belief in welcoming refugees with the practicalities of her country absorbing so many of them. She was in South Tyrol, I was in Tyrol. She phoned as we are normally doing, uh, even during the holidays, and uh, she mentioned that probably Germany could have 200,000 of refugees, and that would be a big problem for Germany. Von Juli an sehr sehr hohe Zahlen hatten von ankommenden Flüchtlingen auch im August war absehbar, dass ähm, wir hier ähm, sehr sehr viele ankommende Flüchtlinge haben werden. But I, I was strongly encouraging her to not to close the border. Merkel came round to Juncker's view that what was needed was a system ensuring that all countries took their share of migrants. But the rest of Europe's leaders would still have to be won over. So far, the French president, Francois Hollande, had strongly opposed any compulsory quotas. Je lui explique, mais plus rien n'est respecté puisque les, les, les migrants et les réfugiés arrivent s'il n'y a pas d'enregistrement, si le contrôle n'est pas sérieux, s'il n'y a pas de possibilité de renvoyer ceux qui n'ont pas droit à rester sur le territoire européen, on est dans la situation exceptionnelle qui aboutit, hélas, à c'est cet afflux de, de, de réfugiés dans des conditions qui n'étaient pas acceptables. Donc ce qu'il fallait, c'était contrôler les frontières. Hollande wouldn't support Merkel's quotas there and then. Instead, their teams got to work on a plan that would include new registration centers for migrants. Then, on the 2nd of September, three-year-old Alan Kurdi drowned trying to make the journey from Turkey to Greece. It was an image that changed everything. The French president immediately contacted Berlin. Ce drame du petit Alian, euh, la tête couchée dans le sable, mais là on le voyait. C'est à ce moment-là que j'ai dit à Madame Merkel qu'il fallait que nous passions, euh, que j'étais d'accord avec elle, à une autre euh, Euh, logique qui était celle de la répartition obligatoire. Mais ça ne nous dispensait pas d'avoir cette politique de contrôle des frontières. Et elle savait qu'il fallait envoyer un message au moins euh, de, de responsabilité. C'est le mot qui revient toujours. Dire que le premier réflexe doit être euh, humain. Ich habe heute Vormittag noch einmal mit dem französischen Präsidenten auch telefoniert und wir sind uns hier einig dass wir innerhalb der Europäischen Union verbindliche Quoten brauchen, um uns äh, die Aufgaben zu teilen. With Europe's most influential leaders now backing compulsory quotas, a solution seemed to be in sight. 
but Hungary's prime minister was still adamantly opposed. Under the new plan, countries like his along the Balkan route would be responsible for processing vast numbers of migrants en route to Germany. Uh, excuse me, but you know, just between us, you know, the, the problem is not a European problem. The problem is a German problem. Nobody would like to stay in Hungary, neither in Slovakia, nor Poland, nor Estonia. All of them would like to go to Germany. Orban decided to demonstrate that the current system was unsustainable. He brought the crisis to a head by instructing his police to stop all migrants boarding trains from Budapest to Western Europe. says is it's merely applying EU law and for people to pass here well, they need valid passports and travel permission. Many of the refugees they don't have documents they just want to get to their destination Germany or elsewhere. The police allowed migrants onto one train that they said was bound for Western Europe. They don't know where they are going. They just get the train and they just want to follow any direction with this train. Maybe this train going to the camp. Mohammed didn't board the train. Those who did soon found they were being taken to a refugee camp and any resistance was met with force. The following day, Mohammed took matters into his own hands. I thought, after this whole journey, I have to stay here in this place. This is not acceptable. He picked up a megaphone and addressed the crowds. I was shouting, I'm going to walk. If anyone want to walk with me, you are welcome. Mohammed led thousands of migrants to the highway towards Austria. The march was watched by the top leaders of Eastern Europe, who were at a meeting in Prague. We have seen some of the press coverage, and it gets scared people, because the last time you've seen so many people uh, walking um, on the highways in Europe was in 1945. So it shook everybody, I think, very strongly. If Mohammed and the thousands with him could cross the border into Austria, they would be only one step from neighboring Germany. That day, the Chancellor was on the campaign trail. She faced a decision that would have consequences for the rest of her career. The Austrian authorities wouldn't let the migrants in from Hungary unless she'd confirmed that they would be allowed to continue on to Germany. Und dann war ja eigentlich nur die Entscheidung, mache ich jetzt durch die Tatsache, dass die Menschen zu Fuß kommen, ähm, die Grenze zu, deshalb also die Entscheidung in dieser Ausnahmesituation, ähm, die Menschen weiter kommen zu lassen. By now, the migrants were approaching the border with Austria. With so much at stake, the German Chancellor needed her coalition partner to endorse her decision. Frau Merkel mich abends anrief und mir gesagt hat, sie würde den Vorschlag machen, Flüchtlinge aus dem Bahnhof in Budapest nach Deutschland zu übernehmen, ob ich damit einverstanden war. Da habe ich gesagt, ja, selbstverständlich bin ich damit einverstanden. Ja, und ich meine, wir sind ein 80 Millionen Volk, 20.000 Flüchtlinge aus Budapest aufzunehmen, ist jetzt nicht so ein Problem. Late that evening, Merkel gave the go-ahead and the Austrian government agreed to let the refugees through its border with Hungary. The Hungarian authorities wasted no time helping them on their way. The government mobilized buses and vehicles actually to collect those migrants uh, on the route and take them to the Austrian borders and uh, let the Austrians decide what they do. Keep in mind that the Austrians were basically inciting what was happening. 
news reached Mohammed that the Hungarian government would lay on buses. Make sure that this bus is going to the border, not going back to the camp. OK, it was very nice to hear about this, but it was very difficult to believe. I had an idea to send the cameraman with this buses. Suspicious of the Hungarian authorities, he got a news crew to board the first bus and see where they were taken. We're going to make interview, me and the drivers, that I want them to give me warranty that they take us there. I called the guy and I put the phone in the microphone and I let him talk. I were the last person, we get a pass and we drive to the border of Austria. I were happy to let everybody inside the border, no accidents, nobody get hurt, nobody get crutch. I felt like a very big mountain on my my shoulder was gone. Welcome to Austria. Welcome. Mohammed made it to Germany, where he would eventually be granted asylum. The weight now landed squarely on Angela Merkel's shoulders. The decision she had taken that night to allow thousands of migrants into her country would send shockwaves throughout Europe. The next morning, the Chancellor tried to enlist her closest allies to help with the thousands of refugees now streaming into Germany. Quand Madame Merkel, face à ces difficultés, demande quand même un soutien, une solidarité, moi je l'appelle en disant nous sommes prêts dans l'urgence à accueillir mille. Hollande asked Merkel for an explanation. Why had she agreed to accepting the migrants into her country? before checking they were genuine refugees. Es musste aus meiner Sicht vermieden werden, dass eines der größten Güter der Europäischen Union, nämlich die Freizügigkeit, jetzt ähm, ähm, in Frage gestellt wird. Elle m'explique que c'est par rapport à un devoir humanitaire. Les, les, les gens sont déjà là aux frontières et, et attendent. Et qu'il y a un risque même pour leur santé. Ce qu'il fallait, c'est que, c'est ce que je lui ai dit, c'est que nous revenions dans le cadre du droit. Parce que là, nous n'étions plus dans le cadre du droit. Et c'était un risque considérable pour l'Union européenne. The pressure on Angela Merkel was about to become even greater. The Hungarian government had sent buses to transport migrants from camps all over Hungary to the border. As the week progressed, tens of thousands were waved through en route to Germany. The message that migrants would be welcomed was spreading across the Middle East. That week, the president of the European Council had the opportunity to see this for himself when he visited a refugee camp on the Syrian-Turkish border. This was one of the most moving moments in my political career. The migrants were absolutely sure that not only Germany, but the whole Europe Mm, it's waiting for them in, in, with, with an open arms. In fact, they even uh, apologized to me and indirectly to Merkel that they are still there in this camp, despite our invitation. But they have no money, no contacts with the smugglers. The only hope for them, the only goal for them was to, to buy the ticket to the European paradise. In Germany, the Chancellor had always fought against border controls inside the EU. Now, her government began to think the unthinkable. Dass es sich um eine Ausnahmesituation und um eine einmalige Entscheidung handelte. Die offene Frage war nur, wie lange diese Ausnahmesituation dauert. 
ging es dann vor allen Dingen um die Frage, was tun wir, wenn Tausende von Menschen im Münchner Hauptbahnhof ankommen, zu einer Zeit, wo das Oktoberfest gar nicht mehr weit weg war. Vor allen Dingen dieser ungeordnete Zustrom nicht etwas ist, was auf Dauer gut gehen kann, und dass wir so bald wie möglich zu Grenzkontrollen übergehen sollten. That night, thousands of armed police prepared to defend the border with Austria. But hours before they were due to be deployed, the interior minister had second thoughts. Eine solche Zurückweisung wäre nur möglich gewesen äh, unter Inkaufnahme sehr hässlicher Bilder. Dann hätten deutsche Polizisten mit äh, am Schutzschild die, diese Flüchtlinge abhalten müssen. Oder mit Tränengas oder mit welcher Weise. Und meine Vorstellung und meine äh, Fantasie reichte nicht aus, dass die deutsche Öffentlichkeit diese Bilder aushält. Naja, was hätten wir machen sollen? Es gab damals in Deutschland Politiker, die gesagt haben, man solle auf Flüchtlinge schießen. Ich meine, das sind Vorstellungen, die wir so absurd fanden, dass das natürlich nicht in Frage kam. Eine totale Zurückweisung hätte bedeutet, wir hätten Österreich in einem großen Zahl Flüchtlingen alleine gelassen. The German police were stood down. Any migrant who said they were claiming asylum would not be turned away. Now, faced with a seemingly endless stream of refugees into Germany, Merkel was even more determined to get other EU countries to take their share. The Commission President was right behind her. I phoned to all the heads of state and government of uh, the reluctant camp, telling them that, okay, you don't want to have a compulsory system, so uh, take a voluntary system. If you do agree to take them in voluntarily, we are no longer insisting on the compulsory system. Major EU decisions had only ever been taken when all member states agreed. Now Merkel and Juncker proposed forcing through compulsory quotas by a majority vote, essentially overruling the Eastern Europeans. But they ran up against the president of the European Council a former Prime Minister of Poland, whose job was to represent individual member states. Politically, it was the most dangerous idea you could even imagine. For me, it was clear that this is the beginning of the end of Europe as we knew. The European Union is an organization built on goodwill. Without goodwill, you have no chance to continue as a, this kind of organization. With Tusk standing firm, Merkel and the Commission decided their only hope was to bypass the heads of government. Interior ministers from across Europe were summoned to Brussels for an extraordinary meeting. On the table was a compulsory system to share 120,000 refugees around Europe. The UK will not be participating in the relocation scheme. We have announced that we will be taking more refugees direct from uh, the Syrian refugee camps. Never before had something so controversial been decided by majority vote. With the stakes so high, Juncker sent his top general into battle. Usually I would not go myself to a council meeting but given the gravity of the situation, I thought I would go there to say, we need to do this now. And do we really have to have a vote on this? Is this not something that appeals to your better angels? The European Union exists because we accept that we have a joint responsibility for crises. And it cannot exist if some member states can just say, well, it's not my problem, just sort it out yourselves. Viele meiner äh, Partner äh, haben gesagt, äh, äh, ihr habt jedenfalls den Eindruck erweckt, als wären alle willkommen. Und jetzt, wo es zu viel wird, kommt ihr an und wollt Solidarität. Das ist äh, nicht in Ordnung. And then there were some who were saying, oh, just close the borders and the problem will go away. I think that's, that's beyond naive. That's almost criminally negligent if you believe that that will solve the problem. It looked like a vote would be the only way to break the deadlock. To avoid a complete east-west split, 
the Commission needed to get at least one Eastern European country on board. Their best chance was Poland. But with elections imminent, the minister was wary. J'avais un tête à tête avec la ministre polonaise et je lui ai dit maintenant ça suffit. Nous avons une responsabilité commune. On n'attend plus que vous. On ne peut pas être une machine à régler vos problèmes quand vous en avez et en nous laissant nous seul face aux nôtres lorsqu'on a besoin de votre solidarité. L'Europe c'est une solidarité. After calling back to Warsaw, the Polish minister agreed. But the other Eastern Europeans remained utterly opposed. Now all eyes were on the chair. Would he keep trying for unanimous agreement or call a vote? Jusqu'au dernier moment, je peux vous dire qu'il y a aussi eu des poussées, des poussées, pour me dire fais tout mais ne vote pas. Je ne suis pas un homme qui se laisse influencer au dernier moment par. Euh, on est petit, hein, les Luxembourgeois, mais on est tenace. Et on est européen, et on l'a fait. Despite the potential fallout, he called the vote. A system to share 120,000 refugees around the EU was finally passed into law. In and by itself, the decision we took today is not going to solve the refugee uh, crisis. But without this decision, I think we would not have been in the possibility to now take the next steps. The following day, as Europe's leaders met in Brussels, any sense of unity had been shattered. My Prime Minister was very angry. And his message was, well, you pushed me into the corner. You disrespected the basic rule of European Councils that we all agree jointly that there are no majority votes. Uh, how can we function together if we disrespect the basic agreements we always had between us? My reaction was very strong because older countries from East Europe have a lot of money from European countries, from Italian taxpayers from French taxpayers, from German taxpayers. So if you don't accept to give a message of solidarity, you have to understand uh, this is not a place uh, of uh, um, rights, rights, rights. There are a lot of rights, but there are duties. My Prime Minister said, well, Matteo, tell me what you need. I can give you people to help you run the migration centers. We can give you uh, money, we can give you food for the asylum seekers. Give me a list. And the Italians never actually gave us a list of what they wanted. The only thing they wanted was to simply send the people away. The new plan was soon put to the test. Registration centers were set up in Italy and Greece. But with tens of thousands arriving every week, they struggled to cope. It was only in November that arrangements were in place for the first migrants to be moved on from Greece. They were due to be flown to Luxembourg, but there was a snag. Ταρχίνι πρόσφυγες δεν θέλαν να πάνε στο Λουξεμβούργο. Δεν το ξέρανε. Ήταν μια μικρή χώρα, ήταν έξω από τη δική του την κουλτούρα που θέλαν να πάνε Γερμανία. Κουραστήκαμε να πείσουμε τους πρόσφυγες και να τους εξηγήσουμε ότι είσαστε τυχεροί που θα πάτε στο Λουξεμβούργο. Moi j'ai dû aller à Athènes et dire écoutez je suis luxembourgeois et le Luxembourg est un pays qui veut vous accueillir. Ils savaient dans leur tête un pays c'est l'Allemagne. Et ils ont dit Deutschland, Deutschland, Deutschland. J'ai dit, écoutez, euh, le Luxembourg est un pays, euh, c'est pas euh, le nord de la Groenland, hein, euh, il fait pas trop froid, euh, on n'est pas trop pauvre, euh, et on est, on est prêt à vous accueillir. Bon voyage, bon voyage, bon voyage. The ministers only managed to persuade 30 refugees to move to Luxembourg. At the same time, over 200,000 had arrived in Greece in the past month alone, the highest number ever recorded. The idea of sharing migrants around Europe had nearly torn the EU apart. It was now clear that it was never going to solve the crisis. The 
the goodwill towards migrants was evaporating. Across Europe, anti-migrant parties seized their opportunity. Brussels wants to inundate us with third world immigrants, and that, my friends, will be a disaster. On New Year's Eve, dozens of migrants were accused of attacking women in Cologne's main square. For many, this was the final straw. 2016 began with a new presidency of the European Council. It was the turn of the Netherlands and its Prime Minister, Mark Rutte. To mark the beginning of his six-month term, he hosted the Commission President and his deputy in Amsterdam. I felt we have to deal with this in two or three months at the max. We had to get a grip on the numbers because if not, it, it would create the impression with the general public that politicians were not in control. The most crucial thing was to stem the flow of migrants, uh, to prevent people dying on the agency. And the only way to do that was to kill that business model behind the boat smugglers. For Rutte, stopping the people smugglers meant doing a deal with the country where most of them were operating, Turkey. There is no way you can put a fence in the eastern Mediterranean to stop people from crossing. Once they are in the water, in the boats, they will arrive on a Greek island. So the only way you can actually tackle the issue is by preventing people from getting into those boats. And how can you do that without working closely with Turkey? It's impossible. There were more than two million refugees in Turkey, many intent on coming to Europe. But dealing with its government was controversial. Turkey had been trying to join the EU for years, but with its human rights record, many of Europe's leaders objected. Now, some of them were convinced they needed the Turkish government on side. So far, there had been little success. The previous year, the EU's top brass had met Turkey's President Erdogan at a G20 summit. I was offering him uh, uh, billions, not for Turkey, not for the Turkish government, but for the refugees. We knew by that time that uh, our Turkish partners uh, would, wouldn't like to talk just about migration. They would like to talk also about uh, accession negotiations and the process of Turkish accession to the EU. Erdogan was uh, rather aggressive. He was saying, you are doing nothing for Turkey. That was in the very context of the enlargement negotiations. No new chapters have been opened and all this. Weeks before, we had a meeting with Erdogan in Brussels. I was saying, but uh, you were received like a prince. And he became suddenly very aggressive. He said, I'm not a prince. I'm not a, a developing country. I'm a real uh, democracy. It inflamed Erdogan and he warned us that he could let through thousands and thousands of migrants per day. What will you do, he asked. What will you do then? Uh, what will you, will you mm, uh, shoot at them? At the beginning of 2016, the Dutch Prime Minister, determined to make a difference fast, decided to try a fresh approach. He wanted all migrants crossing the sea from Turkey to Greece to be sent back. He hoped this would stop them trying to get on the boats in the first place. Rutter made his pitch to the Turkish government in the rarefied atmosphere of the World Economic Forum. He chose to speak to Turkey's prime minister, who was known to be more pro-European than his president. I had that meeting with Ahmed Tolu in his hotel in Davos, which was interesting because most of those meetings take place in small uh, speed date rooms. But this was a full set meeting uh, with the prime minister there. I'm sitting here with flags behind us. I want to be formal because we are not making a friendly conversation, just I wanted to make this as a technical meeting with the chair of EU. I wanted to explain that this is not our problem. We didn't create Syrian crisis. We are the victims of Syrian crisis. I told him that 
it was my absolute conviction that together we had to solve this. And that would involve for him uh, to be willing to take back uh, the Syrian refugees coming into Europe at that moment by sending everybody who would arrive in Greece on a boat back to Turkey. And by doing that, creating a momentum to kill this business model of the boat smugglers. He was insisting at that time that Turkey should take all the refugees back. I tried to explain him. Every day our refugees increasing, coming from Syria, from Iraq, from Afghanistan. And this time Europeans, they want us to get their refugees. That total was saying, listen Mark, I know what you're willing, but we cannot take in more refugees. The European Union then has to start showing its goodwill by taking people from Turkey into the EU. I said, impossible. I mean, with the numbers already coming in, how can you expect me to explain to the German or Swedish or Dutch populations that we are going to take in even more refugees because we might then come to a deal with Turkey? Impossible. The two leaders left unable to agree, but decided that their officials should work to find a compromise. They set a deadline for March when they would hold a joint EU-Turkey summit. But they weren't the only ones hatching plans. Two weeks later, Eastern European leaders met in Prague. They considered a radical step, blocking the route towards Western Europe by closing the borders along the way. There's still no common European solution, and we all knew on the spot and at the moment uh, that everything depends on uh, the measures member states are or were willing and were ready and able to do. Viktor Orban was willing to build as many fences as we would want, but the problem was that, that still people would be stuck in the Balkans, and that was dangerous. Of course, you know, there is the poorest region, a lot of uh, Christian versus Muslim tensions, and you know, keeping a million of uh, migrants somewhere in the Balkans could be very flammable. But we realized that if we want to deal with the flow, that we need to help somehow stop the people at some border. The leaders decided on drastic action. They closed the border between Greece and Macedonia, trapping thousands of migrants in Greece. With the gate to the rest of Europe closed, there was little incentive for more migrants to make the journey from Turkey to Greece. It gave the Europeans a much stronger hand in their negotiations with the Turkish government. Just days before the EU-Turkey summit, Donald Tusk headed for Turkey, stopping in Greece on the way. In Athens, I decided to, to make a very brutal appeal to migrants and to smugglers. And I said during my press conference, do not come to Europe. Do not come to Europe. Do not believe the smugglers. Do not risk your lives and your money. It is all for nothing. Greece or any other European country will no longer be a transit country. Maybe it was too brutal, but my hope was that uh, the Turks would get this message. That same day, Tusk travelled on to Ankara to see the Turkish Prime Minister. His press conference in Athens had left its mark. That statement in Athens didn't make us happy. He was quite tense when he came. When you negotiate with Turkey, you have, you have to have also your strong argument. And this is why I used this argument that if you are not able to cooperate with us, we, we would anyway close the border in, in between Macedonia and Greece. This is maybe the last call or the last minute to have a deal with the EU on migration. Because if we really will organize ourselves better, then Europe might be less interested in deal with Turkey. The, the whole um, set of actions to close the border, it wasn't a bluff. It was, it was something real. I tried to tell him that the way to resolve this issue is not putting barriers. If you want to solve this issue, you should not be giving an impression that there will be new Berlin walls in Europe. Davutoglu refused to accept all migrants being sent back. 
But as the meeting broke up, he did agree that Turkey would take back anyone arriving in Greece who didn't qualify as a refugee. In exchange, the Europeans said they would take refugees direct from camps in Turkey. Turkey being Turkey, even a prime minister has to be careful not to take that too far without you know, involving the president in all of this. So at that point, I thought Davutoglu had stuck his neck up, miles. I went home thinking, oh, we're almost there. I think we can actually pull this off. Everything was ready for the summit in Brussels. But as the Turkish prime minister set off, he spied an opportunity. Knowing that Turkey might never again have this much leverage over the EU, he decided to be even more daring in his pitch. When I came in the plane, I called all the diplomats together to a meeting. I just said, we have to be creative. Yes, there are so many different approaches in European Union, prejudices in European side, but refugee issue is our common issue. Let's be creative. He asked his team, if Turkey were to accept all migrants back from Greece, what could they ask for in return? This was a good opportunity, risk and opportunity. So how can we utilize this for all comprehensive Turkish-EU relations? From my plane, I instructed my team to call with German side, also with Dutch side, so that we can have a meeting before uh, the summit. On the eve of the summit, in a breach of EU protocol, Davutoglu hosted Angela Merkel and Mark Rutter at the Turkish embassy in Brussels. Tusk and Juncker were not invited. The Turkish prime minister was risking his political career, going further than his president had ever done. But he knew he could extract a high price and would see just how far Europe's leaders were willing to bend. He came into the meeting and immediately uh, Ahmed said, I want to talk with two of you without officials. I suggested Mark and Angela that three of us we will sit, not delegations. He said, I've been thinking on the plane and I used the journey from Ankara to Brussels and discussing with my official on the plane to come to a decision. And we thought, oh, great, and what is the decision? And he said, I'm willing to move a step further. That was huge. But he, being a politician, he said, I want something in return, which basically was the whole wish list of Turkey in the last 25 years. And we could not agree with that, but at least it started the negotiations. Davut Tolu's shopping list included 6 billion euros for the refugee camps, twice as much as had previously been offered, and the reopening of talks about Turkey joining the EU. The money was basically the easiest thing. Uh, because it, everybody understood that if Turkey would have to deal with the burden, he would also have to support them financially. That was the easiest part. I had to consider all these other wishes. Most contentious, the Turkish Prime Minister wanted his citizens to be able to travel in the EU without visas. But there were 72 criteria that Turkey would need to fulfill for this to become a reality. I am also a politician and uh, a leader who won an election and there were huge expectations from the people and I promised them that visa liberalization will be uh, delivered. He wanted to speed up the visa liberalization. Yes, we can try to speed up, but again, Ahmed, we cannot compromise on the criteria. Some of our diplomats were reluctant because if we receive all the refugees, where will be the guarantee? Uh, their mutual trust is important. And I said, we, have, we, will, we will fulfill our commitment. Let them fulfill as well. Merkel and Rotter had agreed to give Davutoglu almost all of his demands. They now had to face the rest of the European Council and tell them that they had negotiated a completely new deal without anyone knowing. My reaction was like, you know, are, are you kidding? It's impossible. It's, it's a, it would be a catastrophe. Please but stop choking, you know. Uh, Merkel and Rutte, my closest partners in, the, 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 in this process, you know. Yeah, I, I was not, not disappointed. I, in fact, I, I, I couldn't believe that, that this is uh, true.
We didn't expect this breakthrough, it was there, and we could never have come to you guys, the other 26, saying, well, he was willing to deliver on our main issue, uh, but because of the fact that the logistics of the meeting were not right, we had to decline. That would have been silly. My personal opinion was that it's unacceptable with the President of the European Council present in the room have an agreement between Angela and uh, Mark without Donald. I think it was a mistake. Whatever objections were raised, one fact remained. This looked like the best chance to bring down the number of migrants coming to Europe. In order to push the deal over the line, Tusk got Davutoglu to accept that the most contentious aspects of Turkey joining the EU would be dropped. Specifically those objected to by Turkey's old adversary, the tiny state of Cyprus. Some of my colleagues were irritated, but I was Polish prime minister before I became president of the European Union. And I, it was also my personal experience, how important it is to be treated equally as as a regular member state. And it doesn't matter um, if, if it is Germany, Cyprus, Malta or France. We have equal rights, equal obligations. And uh, this is why I think I, I am quite popular uh, in Malta and Cyprus, maybe not uh, necessarily in Germany and France. People were saying, well, human rights and this and that, which was quite understandable. And said, but if we are not having that deal, what will happen? What will happen in Greece? What will happen in, in Italy? Nobody was able to give me a response to that. And so finally this deal with Turkey, although having been heavily criticized by more or less everyone, uh, was finally uh, adopted. Less than two weeks later, the leaders were back together to sign the official agreement. We were not in tears, but it was an emotional moment because this was basically, for me, I felt this deal would stem the flow of migrants. And I still had the pictures in my mind of children dying on the agency. Of course, refugee issue was very sad, but out of this very sad event, we produced also something good for Syrians, for refugees altogether, good for Turkey and good for EU and member states of EU altogether. Nobody lost in this deal. It is typical win-win solution. For the EU, it certainly was a win. That year, whether because of the deal with Turkey or closing the borders, the numbers of refugees arriving in Greece fell by 97%. But it wasn't long before there were losers too. Seven weeks later, Davutoglu stepped down as prime minister. And after a failed military coup in Turkey, the concessions he won were put on hold. In Britain, the prospect of Turkey joining the EU was seized on by the Brexit campaign, as migration became the central issue. Meanwhile, the crisis has provided fuel for anti-migrant populists all over Europe. And while there hasn't been another summer like 2015, over 10,000 migrants have since lost their lives at sea.